Thank you everyone um, for attending today and thank you ever so much to our panel of speakers and also the brilliant Sue Ball for um, you know, doing an amazing job of bringing people together to really show the importance of um, museums and gallery exhibition tax relief and, and the significance it has actually to organisations across the country, especially the charities that are feeling very vulnerable at the moment in relation to the impact of the pandemic. Um, Sue and our kind of whole network across the C uh, van have been really investigating into the um, the the importance of this tax tax relief and advocating advocating and lobbying for its continuation. So we've been putting a lot of energy in talking to MPs and also working with colleagues in DCMS and Arts Council England to ensure that um, come next uh, April that this. Um, uh, tax relief continues and that we show that we have evidence around how important it is for um, the sector to have a, a tax relief that really goes into exhibition making and being able to support um, artists and gallery spaces and museums across the country. So my name is Paula Oral. to introduce myself. I'm the director of CVAN England and I'd like to just hand you over uh, to Sue Ball, who's our brilliant um, executive uh, chair of YVAN for Yorkshire and Humber, um, part of the CVAN network. And thank you ever so much to Isabel Hancock, who's the deputy director of Chisholm Hill Gallery, Will Simpson, who uh, works for RSM UK Tax and Accounting Limited, and Emma Khan, who works for Full Stop Accountants as well. So thank you for joining us today to really help our sector understand the benefits of this tax relief and also perhaps some of the stumbling blocks that you might be coming across when applying for it. So thank you, handing over to Sue. Okay, really good to be with you today. Um, as Paula said, my name's Sue Ball. I'm uh, exec chair with Yorkshire Visual Arts Network and uh, lead for the tax relief for CVAN. And I know today we've particularly invited and we've particularly targeted this event to accountants and also finance directors or, um, or uh, officers who are working within institutions. So good to be with you today. So in a report that summarised 24 months of museums and galleries exhibition tax relief, peer-led support and evidence gathering by CVAN, we concluded that the potential of this tax relief for the museums and galleries sectors cannot be underestimated. For the first two years of its operation from 2017, over £20 million was claimed for 1,345 exhibitions. And once received, the funding is unrestricted to be used as determined by that organisation. It's claimed on an annual basis as part of audit and it can be built into budget forecasts. This is unique in terms of finance support. And as Paula said, the importance of this relief has, of course, been amplified by the impact of the pandemic on the sector. But whilst over the same time period, it appeared that less than 25% of eligible organisations have claimed. And there continues to be a perception by HM Treasury that there is a lack of interest in the museums and galleries tax, tax scheme by the sector due to low or slow uptake. Our researchers looked into this and we know this is not the case. Working across an alliance of museums, galleries and visual arts organisations of a range of scale, particularly looking to small to medium size, we looked to see how we could really help practically to bring as many organisations into readiness and to be able to claim. And unique about this process is that we work closely with HMRC policy and technical advisor for the creative industry tax relief, Stephanie Martinez and her team, and over a hundred organizations in face-to-face -face and online workshops where we could test the relief and see where the barriers are to adoption. So we identified four key barriers to engagement, which cluster around the initial gateway of company eligibility and readiness to claim Organisations need to have both identified and met a range of criteria of which they might initially be unaware. So why have we come here today? Why have we put this on? It's really one of these barriers is the inconsistent knowledge of this tax and 
the wider creative industry tax reliefs or lack of awareness at all from within the accounts infrastructure. And therefore, there's a lack of technical support and expertise to organisations at a range of scale and type of activity. So we've had a range of stories from eligible organisations being informed repeatedly they were not able to claim and some pay, paying for a bit of a learning on the job service with high fees that were not comparable to the claims returned. This is somewhat offset for larger museums and galleries who might have finance directors or resources to be able to contract in. But even so, uh, many have said that the scheme is not necessarily easy to make a first claim and that they have benefited from being signposted to accountants with experience of working or from learning from their particular peer groups in the cultural sector. So today's workshop is therefore to raise the, uh, uh, the awareness of this tax relief within the accounts infrastructure. There is plenty of unmet demand from the sector for you to build your knowledge base around. Will will offer a run through of the tax relief and their role uh, as RSM as a corporate accountancy company in relationship with their client base. And Emma will talk about their proactive relationships through uh, full stop accounts with particularly um, client base of small to medium sized organisations. As this tax relief is self certified in that the client produces the claim, which requires it clear internal processes and logic for financial allocation against expenditure, myself and Isabel will offer experiences on claiming from an insider viewpoint and also a consideration of some of the limitations of the scheme in terms of ineligible activity. And at the end, we're looking for about 20 minutes or plenty of time for your questions. So please add these to the Q&A or chat box as we go through. So I'd first of all like to hand you over to Isabel. Thanks, Sue. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Isabel. I'm the Deputy Director of Chisholm Gallery. Um, Chisholm Hale is a contemporary art gallery. We're based in Tower Hamlets in East London, um, founded by artists nearly 40 years ago. Um, and our remit today is to commission new work, support artists to produce their most ambitious projects to date. Um, we present up to four solo exhibitions in the gallery each year and a range of other projects from offsite to online. Um, and partnership working is really central, so we're often co-commissioning with other UK-based or international organisations and our exhibitions tour to other venues. Um, a bit of financial context, we're a small team, we have nine core staff and annual turnover of, of 650,000 a year, and we receive 25% of our funding from Arts Council England as an NPO. Um, I think I was first introduced to the exhibition's tax relief via a seminar led by Arts Council in 2017. Um, and actually at the time we were coincidentally looking for a new accountant. So we were, um, we were actually able to build into the brief of who we were looking for, that we wanted someone specifically who could not only do our independent examination, but also submit our tax relief claim as well. So that was a kind of really important thing for us. Um, and the accountant that we worked with, that we do work with, had previous experience of the theatre tax relief. So that was obviously really beneficial. Um, we've claimed three times and um, an average of 30,000 pounds each time. So I think, I think sort of my reason for being invited to participate in this, but also my main message is just that it, we found it, we have found it quite a simple process. We are a small team um, and I'm not a finance director, you know, we're not, we're not an organisation with a, with a kind of um, huge finance department, but we have found it relatively simple because of the support we've had from our accountant. Um, and it's just been hugely beneficial because, um, you know, unrestricted money of that amount is obviously very hard to come by. And so it's been something that we've been able to use to support core costs, salaries, kind of hard to fund things. Um, and so for example, our first claim, because we were not really expecting, we didn't know what we would get back, you know, it felt like a really big windfall. And actually we were able to use that money to support the continuation of a curatorial trainee program that we had been running successfully for quite a few years. But um, for whatever reason, in the kind of final year of the program, we hadn't secured the full funding. And so that really enabled us to carry on with that program. Um, 
And then as we've then subsequently been able to build in an estimate of our tax relief claim into our budgets, we've been able to use that to support salary costs of the curatorial um, of the curatorial department. So we now have an assistant curator role, which we didn't previously have. Um, and I mean, I say our curatorial department, that's two people, but having that assistant curator role is completely vital because it means that we've got the capacity to work on really ambitious projects and partnerships that I just think we couldn't have managed with one curator. Um, so yeah, I think that might be all I'm gonna say at the moment, just that we have found it quite simple and we really recommend to do it. Um, but I know there are a lot of challenges, which I think Sue is gonna cover. Thank you, Isabel. Um, I'm Will Simpson. I'm an associate director at RSM, which is a, a UK-based accountancy firm. I specialise in corporate tax, but within that, I probably spend about half of my time working on creative sector reliefs. So specifically, museums and galleries, which we're going to talk about today, is the most recent of those reliefs. I do have some slides, which I'm just going to bring up now. Bear with me. Hopefully you can see those now. So what I wanted to cover, I've got probably 15 minutes. I was going to talk about which companies are eligible for the relief, um, then looking at which exhibitions themselves are eligible for the relief. Briefly going through the claims process, um, concentrating on pulling together perhaps expenditure analysis, which I know Emma's going to cover in a bit more detail after me. I'll just give a high level example of a claim, sort of outlining how the benefit works, and then talk about a few problem areas we, we sometimes come across and try and break some of the myths around this relief. Um, because at the end of the day, we're looking to encourage as many people as possible to, to claim this valuable benefit. Um, if I start off with which companies are eligible, this applies to corporate bodies. And a lot of people are suddenly put off because I've just mentioned corporate, but actually a charity registers with Companies House as a corporate body. Specifically, this relief written into the legislation applies to charities applies to charities, subsidiary of charities, or subsidiaries of local authorities. So all charities could make a claim. We also look at that charity itself needs to maintain a museum or gallery. Now that exhibition doesn't necessarily need to take place in that museum or gallery, but the, the charity should, should be maintaining a museum or gallery space. For an exhibition, it needs to be intended from the start that that exhibition will be open to the general public. Um, probably pertinent at the moment is that that exhibition never actually needs to open to the general public. So if you've got one that you had to cancel because of lockdown, there's still an opportunity to make a claim there. The Charity making the claim needs to be responsible, the one who's mainly responsible for that exhibition at a venue. Again, it doesn't specify where that venue is, so just any venue. And again, not an issue we generally come across on these, but just in part of getting the legislation past the EU, at least 25% of qualifying expenditure needs to be incurred within the UK. Um, Will, could I just interrupt you one minute for your next slide? Are you able to open up the slide so it covers the whole screen? Because I Okay, was... you're seeing the whole thing. Can I? Does it work? Hi. Let me see. Super. Is that better? Yeah. Right. Sorry, I've got two screens on this laptop. 
causes confusion. So I will talk about the companies that are eligible. Then let's have a look at the exhibitions which are eligible. So it needs to be a public curated display of exhibits um, of historical artistic interest. Um, so public, it needs to be open to the general public, as we've already talked about. That doesn't preclude exhibitions that might have one-off events. So you, you might have a an introductory event on the first night for all of your donors. You can still make a claim there, but as long as there is an intention to be generally open to the, the public. It needs to be a curated display. So that does mean there needs to be some sort of thought to the narrative behind what's on display. Um, it's not a just general jumble of exhibits pulled together. Um, and then specifically, there are exclusions. So we'll probably cover a few of these in, in a bit of detail later on, but if the main purpose is to sell items on display, to advertise, if it includes an element of competition, if there's a live performance, if unless that's merely incidental, then, then those exhibitions probably wouldn't qualify. But it's always worth a discussion around sort of the gray areas that appear here. And then finally, if there's display of anything alive, then that exhibition wouldn't qualify. So that does rule out all of your, your zoos and your city farms and your um, arboretums, for example. There is a distinction here between touring and non-touring exhibitions. Um, and I'm not going to get into the detail of that, but just to be aware that the rate of the benefit is greater for touring exhibitions. And that's specifically because the government wanted to try and encourage the large sort of central hubs of museums to try and take their exhibitions out to the regions. Um, if I have a look at the claims process, so we've talked about it, it's kind of misbadged as a corporate tax relief. Um, you don't need to be paying corporate tax. Um, it's not a relief from a corporate tax liability, but it is administered through the corporate tax process. So a company making a claim needs to prepare a tax return, which in itself would include statutory accounts, a form CT600, a computation to support the figures in that, that form and various disclosures around eligibility of the exhibition. We'd also certainly recommend that an expenditure analysis is provided as part of that claim, because all these claims go across the desk of the team at HMRC. It's a small team and they've got very limited time to review claims. So the easier that we can make it for them to see where the, how the claim has been built up and where the analysis comes from, the quicker they'll be able to sign off and approve those claims. We talk about deadlines briefly. So the deadlines for making claims are the same as they are for tax returns. So a year following your year end is the deadline for a tax return. And then that tax return can be amended for two years following that. So it's probably just worth drawing out on that point that there are plenty of charities who will have expenditure over the last two or three years, which they could possibly make a claim on now. And that's cash that's sitting on the table waiting to be claimed. Um, and then the final point that once the tax return submitted, then HMRC do aim to turn around, approve a claim and make payment within 30 working days, assuming they don't have any further queries, um, which generally, if you've given all the information, they would want to see the pretty quick to turn that around. If I concentrate on the expenditure analysis, because as a professional, you're, you're probably more familiar with the accounts and the, the form CT600, um, but the expenditure analysis itself for a claim, first off, we're looking to identify all the specific income and costs in respect of an exhibition. So 
generally it's fairly straightforward to draw out direct costs. We'll have invoices posted to systems which can be pulled off and allocated to the exhibition itself. But we also need to think about apportion costs, which can often be the majority of the claim itself, because we'll have staff time that won't have necessarily been allocated to exhibitions. We'll have overheads as well, which can be pulled in. And often that's where there's more of a judgment, where we're looking for a, a true and fair apportionment of time, um, which does involve working very closely with the charity to identify individuals and the amount of time they will have spent working on pulling together exhibitions. Um, looking at income for exhibitions, it's only if income is specific to that exhibition that we need to pull it in. Um, if you've got a general entrance fee to your museum or your space, it's we don't need to apportion that to the exhibitions within your venue. So generally, we don't tend to find that there's income that it would be brought into a claim. So if I've now got my, in effect, a, a profit and loss for that exhibition itself, what I then need to go through and identify is all the core expenditure. And it's that core expenditure which I can make a, a claim on. Core expenditure is generally the cost of producing, curating, installing, and then at the other end, deinstalling and closing that exhibition. So it, it's not the running time. The government's sort of keen to promote new exhibitions, and that's the purpose of this relief. It's not to um, support ongoing exhibitions which, which aren't changing. So it, it's that work before opening and the work after opening and then in addition, there are general exclusions around purchasing exhibits, um, storage costs generally, unless certain storage costs are allowed if you're, if you're touring, then marketing costs, finance costs would be excluded as well. But once I've identified all of those core expenses, I'm allowed an additional 80% deduction. Um, and to the extent that that creates a loss, which normally it would because I wouldn't have any income for this exhibition. I can surrender that um, additional deduction for a tax credit at 20% or 25% if touring. So that equates to a benefit of 16 pence in the pound for my, my core expenditure. Um, now for each exhibition that is, there is a, a further limit on that. So you can only claim a credit of up to 80k per exhibition, but that does equate to half a million of core expenditure. So it, it's rare that that threshold would ever be, be reached. Um, it probably is just worth mentioning that these claims are calculated on a cumulative basis. So if, I, if I'm doing work on an exhibition over a number of years, I will need to sort of monitor those costs on a cumulative basis and make claims year on year, ensuring that, again, I'm not breaching this 80K threshold for that particular exhibition. If I move on, this is again, a high level example. So assume I have an exhibition I've spent um, 100,000 pounds on. If I assume 50% of that is core producing. So my time curating, producing, installing, and closing it. And then 50% is non-core, so perhaps advertising, marketing, running costs. If I then, I'll have core expenditure of 50K, I'll be allowed an additional deduction at 80% of that, which is a, a 40,000 pound deduction. And then I can surrender that 40,000 deduction for a tax credit at 20%. So I get, £8,000 cash back from HMRC on submission of the tax return. So that's where my 16 pence in the pound comes from for core expenditure. I'm just going to finish with a few problem areas, um, just where we'd always sort of recommend that further discussions had. Um, the first is capital expenditure. So I've mentioned perhaps on purchasing exhibits can't be included as part of your claim, but also 
if you're going through a refurbishment perhaps of your um, venue, then it's it can be tricky to know where that refurbishment of the building stops and the work on the exhibition itself starts. So that's something we'd, we'd always look to understand and, and discuss with, with the claimants. In terms of qualifying exhibitions, again, we'll probably cover this in more detail, but the, there are a number of gray areas as to if you've got a live aspect to your um, exhibition, does that preclude you from making a claim? Um, if there are a few items that are alive, if you stuck a banana to the wall with gaffer tape, does that preclude your exhibition from being um, eligible? Um, similarly, record keeping, which uh, Emma will cover in a bit more detail, and again, infrastructure costs. So that again, that's talking about the the capital expenditure point. So, yeah, if I'm refurbishing my building, where do my building costs finish, and where do my exhibition costs start? And then a few myths, because ultimately we want to make this a simple process or as simple as we can to as wide an audience as we can. HMRC are keen for people to, to claim this. Um, Arts Council are keen to promote it. I mean, and we're working hard to try and make as many people claim it as possible. So the first off, it's still frustrating that we're hearing charities can't claim the relief because really charities is who the relief is aimed at. It's unusual for legislation to specifically say that charities can claim it, but they, it does in this case. Um, there's no need to pay tax to benefit. The, your charity may never have had to do a tax return in the past, but it can apply to do a tax return this, this year and make a claim. Um, it's too complicated. Well, actually the process of putting that tax return together is no different than it is for any other charity. And putting together the claim itself is relatively straightforward. The manuals that HMRC have provided online are very good. Um, so I'd highly recommend that you read those if, if you are talking to the, your clients about this. Um, Looking at venues, this can apply to a, a number of places. If it, we call it museums and galleries relief, but actually you don't need to be a bricks and mortar um, museum in the, in the town centre. It applies to sculpture parks, libraries, for example. You can have reception areas that perhaps have a gallery aspect to them. Um, again, an exhibition doesn't need to be what you might think of as a room full of exhibits. It could in itself just be one exhibit. So I've worked with um, museums where they might make a claim for a cottage, which has been done up in a, in a certain period because that in itself is an exhibit and we can treat that cottage as an exhibition. Um, I touched on it earlier. We've got abandoned exhibitions. We can still make a claim even if we don't open that exhibition to the general public, as long as the original intention was, then we can make a claim. And that's really important for charities at the moment, um, trying to access as many pools of cash as possible. And then finally, this is one that I've come across on a, on a few um, charities where they've been told they have to set up a subsidiary to make a claim. And that's, that's patently false. There are certain areas where it might be beneficial to have a subsidiary, but there's no reason for a charity to set one up just to make a claim. So hopefully that's addressed a general overview of the relief itself. Um, and please get out of there and make, make claims <laughs> as you see fit. So with that, I will, I will pass on. Thanks, Will. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Emma. I'm part of the Full Stop Accounts team. Um, we're based in Cardiff, but we have UK wide clients. Um, we work with small businesses in a wide variety of sectors, so profit making and not for profit, CICs, and arts based charities. Um, 
at the moment we have three charities that we actually claim creative tax credits for. Um, that's a mixture of orchestral, theatre and museums and galleries. Um, so it's uh, what I want to get across with that really is that it's part of my job, probably my favourite part actually, um, but it's not, you know, we're not just a tax specialist. So uh, any accountant could do this. And um, yeah, so I've got, um, I was going to run through what I would do as um, starting off a claim um, and what the initial setup would be with a charity. Um, but also um, I'm going to highlight an example of um, a charity that we've worked with really recently um, on the claim. So um, a quick overview, um, Will's covered most of the technical stuff and the eligibility stuff. So um, the first thing we would do would be to check that the charity was uh, registered for corporation tax because many aren't. Many don't um, realise that they can be or that they would have to be to be eligible. Um, then we would set up a system together to capture the eligible costs um, and set up a system to capture the staff time that Will was talking about um, because that does tend to be a large portion of the costs. Um, and um, as, as the accountant or the person filling it in, um, as Will said, getting an understanding of the HMRC guidelines and there's also a sort of template that I've been using that um, seems to do really well with HMRC, um, which I think is available on their, on their website now. Um, so yeah, initially um, I would sort of sit down with the with the charity and highlight the importance of setting up the systems to ensure the right bookkeeping and reconciling in the first place. So really identifying accurately what costs are spent on what exhibitions. Um, they may have this in place for their budget reporting anyway, um, but we would fine tune that. So whether it's tracking costs per on the system per tracking categories or separate codes in your finance system um, for different exhibition spends. Um, or if the system doesn't allow for that sort of thing, then even uh, just really accurate descriptions on the invoices. Um, so putting in that time and an effort right at the beginning when you're doing your bookkeeping, um, that really pays off. So it can involve a bit more setting up and training maybe than others. Um, but it's worth it year on year when it comes to this. Um, and then in addition, keeping the track of the hours spent. So in the different sections, so the run up to during and the, the post and dismantling of the exhibition. Um, so that can be some finance systems offer that as a time tracking thing, or as Will said, it can be trying to sort of sit down at the end of that month and allocate a percentage time or diff of different people. Um, then, so that would be the sort of setup sort of time. And then when it comes to actually making the claim, hopefully your system's in a really good shape from doing that initial like groundwork that you can run a report from the system that will show all your costs and your staff hours. And you'll sit down with the client to talk through the different stages and try and allocate those to the different um, eligible parts of the, of the um, exhibition. Um, we would then compile these costs by the eligibility, use the, the template to fill in the headline figures. Um, and what I also, um, so we, we attach that to the tax return, but what I also attach um, is an, like a one page overview report with these headline figures in it and a, about a paragraph or two description of the project and exhibition. Um, it's not strictly a requirement uh, by HMRC, but it gives them a bit of extra info. And I think it demonstrates the kind of project, the cultural benefit behind the figures and that kind of human touch. So we, we like to do that. Um, so yeah, we attach all that to the submission then. Um, I'm gonna quickly talk about, so um, one of the uh, clients that we've done this for recently, so I'm just working through their second claim, they came to us uh, needing a new accountant. They just become a charity. I think before that they were a, a, a not-for-profit. So they just registered as a charity. Um, they were a, well, they are um, a gallery based in Cardiff. 
and they um, get grants of about, so they're very small, get grants of about 250,000 a year, a majority of which is from Arts Council Wales. Um, we actually both kind of, I was already doing the other creative tax reliefs. We both found out about this relief roughly the same time. Me thinking, yep, yeah, this looks good for you. Him thinking, we can't apply for this possibly, or could we apply for this? Um, they, nobody in the organization was really a finance person. They've obviously kept on top of their own budgets and for Arts Council uh, reporting. Um, but this was something that wasn't really on the radar of how to apply. Uh, they weren't registered for corporation tax. Um, as I said, they were a new charity. Um, so we went through that process with them, which is very easy. Um, and yeah, they thought they also thought that they were too small to apply. Um, the claim, I think the first claim ended up being about uh, 11,000 pounds back to them which as Isabel says, it's smaller than Isabel's um, cha charity claim, but it's unrestricted funds. It's, yeah, anything, something to spend all your money on, um, core costs and things like that. So yeah, they were really happy with that. Uh, unfortunately this year it will be lower because they've only managed to get one exhibition in that period that actually managed to go ahead, unfortunately. Um, but we are looking into, as as Will said, actually about um, applying for some of the other planned work. So if any costs have gone into that, um, even if it didn't go ahead, if you committed to it and committed to opening to the public, then you would be able to apply for those costs. Um, so, yeah, the, the steps I ran through at the beginning, that's what we did with them. And now we can pull a report and it's really clear like where they are. I'd say if you had a bigger organisation, um, you might want to do that on a quarterly basis so they can kind of plan um, or sort of see how much they're going to be getting in at the year end. Um, in our case, I think it's going to be fairly steady each year. Um, so that might not need to be done, but it could be done in line with, with doing your budgets and stuff each quarter. Um, just to say sort of the main issues then of what we've come across, obviously people not realising that they're eligible. Um, having a real lack of systems in place um, to actually capture that um, accuracy of data. Um, one thing I suppose we haven't mentioned is the cost of making that claim. So if it is a small claim, um, how, do you, so how do you as an accountant um, price up that piece of work? Is it worth it for the charity to claim it? Um, and what, what I did was be really transparent about it and just say, look, we think that from a high level view, rather before we sort of done the whole calculation, um, just sort of said, right, this is sort of the ballpark, 10 to 15,000 um, will be what you claim. Here's our fee. How do you feel about this? And that, so there's full transparency there um, before any, you know, there's no hidden costs or anything like that. You know, it's, it is what it is. Um, and then sort of just a couple of hints, I suppose we've talked about them really, was um, to use the HMRC guidance and template, um, adding that overview for that human and cultural touch. Um, and there are resources, I know that um, that's going to be talked about in a minute and shared with you at the end of, of the webinar, but you use them because there's a lot of information out there. And as Will said, apply. <laughs> cool, thanks very much. I'm handing back to Sue now, I think. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much for that. It's such a useful overview. And I think your particular sort of perspectives on it and particular tips and hints are, um, are really useful. Um, so the, we're going to now talk from maybe the, I call it the insider point of view. Um, you know, for the financial directors or the um, staff within an organisation who'd be putting together the claim. And as we said, this is a, um, a, a claim that, you, that the organisation itself uh, presents so that we need to have, organisations need to have some clear systems in place and a logic for making that claim as well. Um, so 
because it was hard for a lot of the organisations that we have been in contact, it was very difficult to actually identify and locate a, um, an accountant uh, that have existing knowledge or sort of experience. And it is really essential to have that service of an accountant who one knows about the tax relief, but also has the technical facilities to be able to submit it. Um, so we developed actually for organisations that were considering it a, a readiness guide and again that's one of the resources and I'm just going to run through so this is for an organisation um, just to consider the sort of basics of, of whether they're eligible if they want to go forward so is my organisation charitable do I show exhibitions to the public in a space that I manage do I keep a record of costs from the very first planning meeting do I have a way to allocate, allocate overhead cost tweets to each exhibition and to my general running costs? Does my accountant understand the stencil uh, provided by HMRC, the template for reporting? Do my directors understand the potential of this tax relief? Does my curatorial team understand the potential of it? And is the right person leading on this? So is there a team of people in your organisation that needs to work to look at uh, the claim? What else do I need to know to be able to implement it? So there was a, a sort of set of questions to ask yourself, uh, because I think to make ready in the first claim is the difficulty. I think, as we've said, is once you're claiming and you've got systems in place, it's, it, it's, fantastic, it's straightforward. So how do we help organisations uh, make ready and claim? And just to, before I hand over back to Isabel, just to talk about systems within uh, Chisholm just wanted to really absolutely ramp home the, the fact that this is innovation, this money that comes to organisations has economic, social and cultural benefits for the sector and from each of those organisations. You know, the we've talked to um, cultural organisations that have, have, we've already said, new staff or the retention of staff, um, exhibition costs, public events, catalogues, creative learning work, training, research and development bursaries with young curators. And all of this really, I think organisations really, it enables them to engage with wider audiences and to go much deeper. And also, um, where costs are not eligible, like digital programming and live art, the unrestricted funds has gone back into those ineligible areas of activity. Um, Organisations are building their res reserves, uh, which at a time, you know, in terms of this uncertainty is really important in terms of sustaining long term the infrastructure. And, um, and also paying real living wages, including statutory increases to their staff is an ethical, you know, um, element in terms of, but, but, but choices can be made. So in terms of uh, optimizing claims by working with HMRC in the sector, uh, we feel that there are other opportunities and it would be good, we're, we're putting on a, um, an online uh, workshop looking at this um, on the 28th of August, which is looking at really in terms of what sort of innovation are organisations um, developing in light of the tax relief. So one of the things we heard that the, the opportunity for artists or cultural residency programmes could fall within production phase and could be eligible if they result in an exhibition. This might not be full cost, but definitely something if you're doing that uh, that could be tested and shared with the sector. So, you know, for many small to medium sized organisations, artist residencies, cultural residencies are really, you know, international, national, really bringing fresh ideas into a, a gallery. Also works that are exhibited in outdoor sites and public spaces could be eligible. Uh, the organisation needs to demonstrate that it's maintaining the site, not just the exhibition, but in terms of public or meanwhile spaces, uh, could that op be opened up uh, if you have some sort of lease or some agreement on that space in the longer term, uh, could you be able to claim with that? So I think there are opportunities here that um, the sector themselves can share in terms of uh, how to optimise and how to support innovation um, within your programme. 
Uh, I think, as I've just sort of said, that the claim is self-certified as in that the client produced the claim, which requires this internal process and logic uh, for financial allocation against expenditure. And Isabel is going to say a bit more about that. But it is an opportunity to think about, uh, you know, how this money can be brought back into an organisation, uh, not just to sustain it, but to manage risk taking and innovation in terms of curatorial programming. So um, I'd like to hand you over now to Isabel to say more about Chisenhow. Thank you, Sue. Um, yeah, so I think in terms of um, our kind of internal processes, I think um, actually what Emma was describing about the clients that she worked with is quite similar to how we've been working. Um, I mean, as I said before, we have found this to be a relatively simple process, but I think that has been in a large part because we have had really good support from an accountant who had previous experience with the tax relief. So um, at the beginning, um, we're, we're a registered charity and we're also a company, so we have a company number as well. But at, at the beginning, I was, I admit, slightly confused about the fact that it would be a corporation tax return. We hadn't done a corporation tax return um, and we didn't have a corporation tax number. So as Emma mentioned, we had to, we had to get that. But um, the accountant was able to tell us what we needed to do. It came through very quickly um, and was all quite simple. Um, in terms of our kind of record keeping and internal processes, I think, you know, because we are quite a small organization, we have been doing things on, in quite a kind of lo-fi way, I guess. Um, and I think that works for us because as a small team, um, I, you know, I'm the person who's sort of looking after the, the the tax relief claim but I have quite a detailed knowledge of the income and expenditure for each, each exhibition because I'm working very closely with the curatorial department managing their budgets um, so I mean really we you know we were already and we continue to to code expenditure to each exhibition we do that through SAGE um, and so when it comes to kind of compiling the information for the claim to send to the accountant our bookkeeper um, provides me with stage reports on each exhibition. At that point, I can then comb through them and um, take out things that are ineligible. Um, so for example, the costs that were that I know took place to do with the running of the exhibition rather than beforehand or afterwards. Um, we actually don't have kind of separate codes for those things, but I think perhaps if you were, um, particularly if you were a larger organisation, I can see that that would be really important. But if your finance department was maybe not so closely linked with your curatorial department or with the general running of the organisation, that would certainly help. Um, I find that, you know, as I'm doing that process, I would go back to the senior curator to ask a few questions, but it's usually not, you know, not, not too um, arduous. Um, and then in terms of apportioning salary costs, um, Again, we have been, we've been doing this in a kind of, um, I guess what we consider to be a logical way, not hugely technical. Um, we have two members of staff who are directly involved in curating, producing, presenting exhibitions. So those salary costs are apportioned across the number of exhibitions that they've been working on in that year. Um, and then we also look at the director's salary as well, because um, the director is very much involved in the curatorial process too. So um, not the whole salary, because she's also involved in lots of things to do with running the organization of fundraising particularly, but um, we take a portion of her salary and then divide that again between the exhibitions that we've delivered that year. Um, and that's really it. That's what I provide to our um, accountant. Um, and then he submits the claim through his systems. At the, um, and he does that at the same time as doing our um, independent examination. And in terms of fee, we pay a flat fee for both those pieces of work. Um, so yeah, as I say, I've sort of found it to be relatively straightforward. Um, and I think I was kind of surprised to know that lots of organisations don't claim, but I think hearing that perhaps people have had advice that they can't or they're not eligible um yeah I can I can see that because I think at the beginning had we not have had some good advice we might have been like oh this is not for us um just that first hurdle of the fact that we've never done a corporation tax return we might have gone okay that means we can't apply um yeah and I think um the other thing I was just going to talk about 
very briefly was um, the kinds of things that are and aren't eligible and in terms of how that affects because um, a number of people have kind of asked me, does that affect your curatorial decisions or does that affect like what you would choose to put in an exhibition? Um, and I think um, for us, I would absolutely say it doesn't. And I think we'd always start from a position of, you know, we're not choosing what goes into an exhibition based on whether we can then claim tax relief on it. Um, I think that wouldn't you know, be the right way to work at all. But I think... Um, one of the things that I certainly felt at the very beginning, having gone to an Arts Council briefing about the tax relief, was that it seemed very much geared to a kind of um, traditional form of exhibition making and um, that perhaps also some barriers for the kind of small to medium scale organisations within the contemporary arts sector are that perhaps the work we're producing might not fit these categories um, very easily. So I, I think... Um, for example, if there were to be changes from HMRC as to what would and wouldn't be eligible, I think um, certainly performance art, live performance is a really big thing. And um, as Sue had kind of mentioned also digital work, um, particularly obviously in the past year, we, we managed to present one exhibition 2020 um, and we haven't canceled anything we've postponed. So we will we'll be claiming on exhibitions next year but we've done loads of digital work in that time and um, if there was the potential to also claim for digital exhibitions and online commissioning I think that would make a really big difference um, and yeah I think um, you know we've had a lot of conversations with our accountant about whether a performance element of an exhibition was integral or incidental and you have to kind of take a judgment call on those things but I think in reality for contemporary visual arts um, there's lots of cases where those those works are really um you know the kind of work that we're producing and so it would be useful if those could be included in the claim um i think that's it am i handing back to sue i think it's over to me yeah. isabel to share the questions which we have got many um so thank you emma isabel and and will um for your yeah, your brilliant kind of myth busters, uh, Will. That was just some really great um, points there around kind of the, the issues that um, organisations, some organisations um, are facing. Also, I thought it was really interesting around kind of exhibitions not taking place. Um, and obviously this 2021 year, um, you know, the, that, that the impact of the pandemic and, and then also the financial kind of, being able to forecast um, this year is going to be, you know, is, is going to be huge, really, isn't it, on organisations. Um, it'd be good to kind of pick up on that a little bit, Will, maybe just first of all, and Emma, around kind of actually how perhaps organisations might think about making a claim for exhibitions that took place, but the public can experience them or taking place in the sense of a hell of a lot, let, lot of research has gone into them um, and then obviously not being able to take place as well. So it'd be good to kind of think around that first of all, if that's okay. Yeah, of course, shall I pick that up? Yeah, thanks yeah. Will. Um, so, yep, yeah, I think I, I sort of alluded it to us in my slides, but the, the nature of this relief is the fact that it's cumulative so claims can be made on one exhibition over a number of years. So we don't need to actually wait until that exhibition opens to the public. We can make a claim as soon as we start incurring costs. So it may be that I've, for example, spent last January, February, March preparing an exhibition with a view to it opening last summer. I will have incurred three months worth of costs and I can make a claim on those costs now even if that exhibition is not going to open because it got postponed for another year um, so really it's just bearing in mind as soon as those costs are being uh, hitting your your income and expenditure then we should be making a claim early on that's brilliant emma did you have any points to add there um I don't think so. I mean, I would say that even if the exhibition actually has to be cancelled as well, if it's never going to go ahead, so, you know, those exhibits need to be returned to um, the artists or whatever, um, then they can still, the, the actual costs incurred can still be claimed. Yeah, great. Yep. 
Okay, well, that's brilliant. And I'm sure kind of relief for um, the participants on this uh, webinar today as well. Um, all right, the first question, because we have many. Um, what if an exhibition is a partnership? Um, this organization had one exhibition off site where finance is run mainly by another body, but planning and site issues mainly us. Um, I suppose, it, yeah, go on, Will. Yeah. Yeah, if I pick that up, there, there are probably a couple of points here. I don't know if by partnership you mean a legal partnership. So, I think probably referring back, it does apply only to corporate bodies. So, an, an LLP type partnership wouldn't be able to make a claim. But I think what you're meaning is there's a partnership where one charity is working with another to put on an exhibition in another venue. So this can get slightly more complex because there is um, a, there's a definition of primary and secondary production companies for this relief. And it does mean that actually if you if you're the primary production company, you can make a claim for those costs of putting on the exhibition in the first venue. If you're the secondary one, so perhaps if you're hosting that exhibition, again, you can make a claim for bringing that exhibition into your venue. So two people could make a claim on the effectively the same exhibition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, brilliant. Um, I just noticed in the chat, um, Boart, the questions are in the Q&A and I'll, I'll read them out and then put them as uh, answered live. Um, so you've got a copy of them for your record as well. Um, does open to the public include exhibitions at venues that charge entry? Yep, yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Great, that's a good easy one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the next one actually as well. Yeah, so the next question is we have a general admission fee. So no fee if just going to the cafe, etc. So would you not allocate the admission fee to the show? No, I think the only instance where I would allocate a general admin fee to an exhibition is say, for example, you've got a new exhibition and you add on an extra two pounds for entrance, then we could it's difficult to say that that's not due to the new exhibition but if you if your entrance fee hasn't changed when your new exhibition's put on i see no reason for allocating any of that income to your exhibition um what about if the core expenditure is funded by a grant i think we've pr you've probably answered that but um worth sort of clarifying um the position there Yes, that's right. So if we've got um, grant, which is specifically received for core expenditure, then I would bring that in as part of my income for the exhibition. But it doesn't mean that I can't include that expenditure within my core expenditure when I'm working out my um, deduction, which I can surrender for a, a tax credit. Yeah. So the majority of the organisations that both... Um, Emma and Will, that you kind of, your clients are Arts Council funded if they're you know, from devolved nations and Isabel, the Chisholm Hells funded directly core from Arts Council England as well. So um, yeah, it's clear that clear that the charities that are funded by um, public money from the Arts Council can um, apply. Yep. So how broad is the scope for exhibitions? This is a really good question. Our arts and events department delivers a very broad program across many of our event spaces venues. And this includes things like open studios. Are these eligible? I yeah, think it, it's, it's always worth a discussion, thing. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, have you got some thoughts there? Um, well, I think uh, actually when Will went through all the eligibility, um it is a really open um eligibility um there's you know very th few things that determine that you're not qualifying so for example like things for sale things that are alive that we've spoken about um but it doesn't even need to be in that exhibition space it can be out and about um yeah that's each each thing will probably need to actually look at the criteria and look at it against it um, but I would have thought 
and, and then maybe that alludes to Sue's point of a bit more clarity from HMRC. But when I'm looking at it, um, looking at eligibility, um, I think it's fairly clear on what isn't allowed. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've had any will that are kind of borderline ones. I haven't as yet. Um, I think it does vary from organisation to organisation, and a lot of it's how you present that exhibition. Um, but I've never really come across one that hasn't qualified, um, except where perhaps, I mean, Isabel, you talked about the, the live element that has caused issues. Um, and certainly there are some people where I've we've been having a lot of discussion around the sort of digital um, online displays recently. HMRC, unfortunately, are quite categoric that an, a, an online display does not constitute an exhibition at the moment. So there are a lot that don't get through that, that first hurdle. Um, but generally, if, if we're thinking about normal exhibits on display to, a, to the general public, it, I haven't come across many gray areas. Sorry, Sue, you've got to... Yeah, just to sort of say the organisations that have had these queries, I mean, there's, you, you talked about the banana and the gaffer tape as a sort of a, a potential sort of live art, but there was a, there's the Thackeray Museum, which is the leeches scenario. It's almost like in precedent. And also home had the carrot incident. Um, but I think I think the thing is with the, the creative industry, the tax relief, a team, they get back to you quite quickly. So I think there is a, a helpline. And I think that um, at times, I think it, during this last year when things have been uh, difficult in terms of um, pandemic and stuff like that, but the feeling back from the sector is that they can pick up the phone and they can have a conversation about uh, some of these more subjective um, issues of claiming. Um, so I, you know, so so do have a word. Do get in contact with HMRC if you feel that you need to uh, qualify something earlier rather than later as well. There's a good question in the chat that relates to the kind of, you know, the claim in relation to a kind of a public space. Um, and can this apply to non-art venue, i.e. an exhibition that takes place in high street shop? I think it's a really good question about that clarification, isn't it, around, you know, you're an organisation that makes exhibitions, but you're presenting them in temporary spaces, and that temporary space is a public space, and that space is the space that you're looking after as well um, for that duration of um, the exhibition. So um, any thoughts there, Emma and Will? So if, if I start off in terms of being an eligible company to make the claim, you do have to maintain a museum or gallery. So not anyone can just set up an exhibition in a shop in the high street. But assuming you do meet that criteria, there's no requirement for that exhibition to take place in your venue. If you are making an exhibition on the high street, yeah. then that becomes your venue. Yeah. Put yeah. a claim in. Great. But again, can I just pop, I mean, again, in terms of innovation, I think this is enormously interesting. If you've got a gallery now and you're looking at meanwhile use or taking on other spaces, um, particularly with the consideration of opening up the high street and um, high street funds, you know, there are, there are points here where organization you might want to particularly look at that in terms of future program so i think it does facilitate um uh, yeah conversations internally in terms of like uh, developing other um maybe more accessible venue spaces uh particularly if you're working with different communities or you're targeting or wanting to reach different types of people and audiences Great, there's a question around CAPEX. Um, to confirm, did you say that CAPEX does not qualify? Because frequently a lot of exhibition setup costs could be considered as CAPEX. D display stands, for example. Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. And, and this can require a bit more thoughts. We've got, if we have a display stand that's put in 
and the expectation is it's going to be used for all sorts of exhibits over the next 20 years then mm -hmm. i think that to me feels like a, a capital item mm -hmm. if we're saying we've got a display span stand which is specific to that exhibition that i'm putting on mm -hmm. um and i'm not really expecting to use it beyond that then there could be an argument to include that in the claim mm -hmm. so i think it, it depends on on the item yeah yeah Okay. Um, does insurance cover for loan works over duration of the exhibition count as core or is it deemed a running cost and so not eligible? Yeah, again, that's quite a good question. I think it probably depends how that insurance um, is worded. Um, it could be that actually a lot of the risk is around the transportation of that exhibit at the start and the end. So bringing it into your venue um, so in that case, I would include the, that cost of insurance because bringing that exhibit to your exhibition is part of your setup costs. But if it's sort of per day that your exhibition is open, then I think that to me feels like a running cost. Yeah. So there are lots of really good technical questions coming up actually. Um, and this covers insurance. So we're going to get through them. Um, we've, we have got time, so we are going to get through them. Um, does insurance cover for loan works over duration of the exhibition um, count as a core or is it deemed a running cost? So that covers the kind of similar question there. Yeah, I think again, that's yeah similar to the insurance. If, if it's a cost of bringing that exhibit to your venue, then include it in the claim but if it's you're just hiring it um, then it feels like a running cost yeah without being specific to an organization what costs would you imagine to be charged by firms against say a fifteen thousand claim the top question yeah will you you get you will yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't worry, Will. laughs> um i'd probably say here that we try and be as flexible as we can on fees and we flex the scope of our work accordingly. So I have plenty of clients where we do everything. We pull all the information together, put the claim together, do the tax return and send it in. Clearly that's gonna be more than if I'm just spending an hour or two on the phone helping the um, claimant put their claim together. So it probably depends how much involvement they Wants, but certainly from my side, I'd be if it gets towards ten percent of the fees, then I'd be questioning whether we can reduce the scope of work to um, ultimately encourage as many people as possible to to make their claims. Yeah, I don't know if you had any thoughts, Emma. Um, yeah, similar. So um, some people we do all the bookkeeping for um and um the claim then becomes part of this bigger thing that you know we'll be doing the year end accounts as well and the tax returns so um it kind of becomes all of, as a one thing um but then like you said if it's just a bit of support then that fee really wouldn't be as high um and you know if you, you sort of think well they've got the systems in place and they want to sort of carry on and do it themselves year on year then maybe that's a couple of hours of support is all they need so the fee would be you know just an ad hoc helping fee really um but yeah i'd sort of agree with you on the sort of 10 10 percent kind of thing but it's not really we don't really charge like a contingent fee because i'd say it's a fairly set amount of work but you try and identify what that work is at the beginning really so yeah Great. I think that's a good point just on the setup costs. Like you say, undoubtedly, there's going to be more time spent in the first year. But once you've got that process in place, it becomes much more straightforward. Um, and fees for supporting in subsequent years would reduce accordingly. So. Yeah. That's a really good thing to think about, isn't it? When forecasting the cost of it, think about it in the first year as, as a more of a bigger cost than the subsequent years. Sue? Yeah, I was just going to ask Isabel, is that how you, is that how you find, you know, in terms of charging? I think um, that's a really important um, question, really. Yeah, I mean, um, 
we work with someone who who does it as part of doing our end of year um, accounts and independent examination so I have to say I actually don't know what the cost like what the separation of those costs would be we have we, we pay um, I think it's sort of in the region of three thousand pounds for the for the both so it's you know it's included and I think that's that was something we were looking for when we were looking for an accountant it was like who can do this kind of package of work for us and there were some accountants that we went to who couldn't have worked like that because we didn't want an audit we only wanted an independent examination so that was kind of how we made our decision mm. yeah can, can I just say that what we're looking at as one of the legacies of, of this workshop is to create a list of accountants with experience and I mean we need to look at how best to do that because we can't obviously suggest a preferred um, list in any way but I think so many organisations are looking to at least start to have conversations with a few accountants and, and just see who works best for them. So uh, this is already happening in Scotland. Scottish uh, Contemporary um, Arts Network is pulling together a list. And I think we would be looking after this um, event to do a similar thing. Um, yeah, to support and to be able to signpost people to accountants with experience. So we'll get back out to everybody if that's okay after this uh, webinar to see how we might collect um, and, and, and start to consolidate that list. Great. I'm going to run through these um, questions, but we've got two good accountant firms here. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Emma, and Will, for giving up your time as well for free to do this. Um, so from A-Space, this is an interesting um, organisation in Southampton where it's a... Um, and they have a um, exhibition display that's installed permanently and then also contemporary exhibitions and then show collections as well. Um, so that, yeah, really interesting organisation that's just kind of opened in the last couple of years and will be making a new claim as well. So this question is about how would receiving VAT refunds on exhibition expenses affect your claim if prepare, preparing the claim retrospectively? Oh, get those words out of my mouth. <laughs> so I'd probably say there that your claim is based on your, your net expenditure. So it would be after sort of fat recovery. So ultimately I will have, my costs will have reduced because I've had a, a VAT refund and the costs I include in the claim would reduce accordingly as well. Yeah, I mean, if your system's set up, in the first place correctly everything should be net anyway so that should be what is drawn into your report to make the claim mm. mm -hmm. um this is a question for isabel do you allocate the full salary of say a curator to each show as simple allocation or do you consider the amount of their time not specifically on a show um yeah so i have i the way i've been um kind of advice to do it and the way we have been doing it is that we have our curatorial staff are mainly working on exhibitions but they do also um, support on kind of media and communications as well so I've been deducting a kind of appropriate amount of their salary that I think they spend on press and marketing communications um, but then the rest of their salaries I've been dividing equally between the exhibitions that I've been claiming for in a particular year. Um, I think when we do our next claim, I'll have to think very carefully about it because obviously a lot of what they've been doing this year, although we're working on shows that will happen, so we will claim for some shows that haven't happened yet, but they will because they've been postponed. They have also been doing a lot of work on um, online projects and digital commissioning, which presumably we can't allocate the time for. Yeah. Um, the question asking if we can share Will's slides, um, if that would be, if that's possible, Will. Yep, yep, that's right. Okay, great. Um, how big a risk is there that the government might rescind this relief, perhaps due to lack of take up? Sue, do you want to answer this question? Um, well, not if we all come together. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I think part of today is to really build that expertise and 
uh, within the accounts infrastructure and make it much easier for organizations to uh, work with accountants who have the expertise to make you know to get it going there is still um, a demand unmet demand within the sector um, and we are working very hard within CVAN to uh, develop uh, peer-led support across the sector and as I say we're going to be running more, more webinars and online uh, workshops for newcomers that's on the 21st of April and then this uh, workshop on the 28th where we're looking at how you might optimize your claims but we're very interested today for you to let us know if there's anything that you know you'd like them tailored in any way so if you could feed that back through the chat, you know, if you could feel that there is a group of organisations or part of your sector that are struggling to get um, access, well, let us know. Or if you think that your organisation is doing some pretty wonderful things and would like to be part of sharing that, that's uh, important. I mean, with Paula and ourselves, in terms of CVAN, there is a, as CVAN allu um, Paula alluded to right at the beginning, there is a campaign around this. Um, in terms of the retention of museums and galleries exhibition, exhibition tax relief that is working now with DCMS, HMRC and going to Treasury. Um, and we've had a positive feedback on that. We're now working with uh, politicians, MPs, et cetera, to make the case. And also to make the case whether we can do that in this time frame or later for those enhancements that would really benefit um, museums, galleries, and art galleries, particularly as um, Isabel said around digital is absolutely key for the sector, um, particularly in terms of future post-Brexit soft power, um, in terms of life performance, in terms of contemporary practice, you know, we need to be a global player here in terms of the work we're producing. Um, uh, in terms of uh, income back on works you know we'd like to be looking at how the sales of works particularly primary sales of living artists and also we'd like to look at the organizations that are not for profit but that don't have charitable status at the minute um, and they are now ex, uh, ineligible we'd like to really look at how we can bring those organizations in because for all sorts of reasons they're not charitable status but they are for profit and um, not-for-profit and, and uh, public facing. So there's a lot of sort of petitioning and campaigning work we're doing in the sector. So good to be, as I say, good to be here with you today. Um, and I mean, after this session, what we'll be looking at is developing your questions as a, an accountancy FAQ. So if you weren't here today, uh, we can um, share those with other um, across the sector and keep on adding to them as well. So as questions come up, rather than people having to go through the same type of preliminary type of um, questioning, we can, that there will be resources where people could go to, um, to be able to sort of speed through some of those um, initial inquiries. There's actually some more questions that we need to answer um, to get through for those who are still with us. So, um, Good question from Mr. Alan Parry. Um, are there any for thoughts of HMRC extending the existing claim window beyond the final fourth year of 2020-2021? Sue? Well, well, we hope so, yeah. If we work together, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. That's what we're, that's what we're aiming for, um, for it to get rid of the sunset clause for it to continue as an open tax relief. That's our, that's our big aim um, with our partners, Arts Council England and DCMS as well. Um, can you clarify what exhibitions delivered outside the venue can be included? We are a multifaceted organization with a gallery and outside program of visual and performance art. So I think on that, there's no reason that anything outdoors cannot be part of a claim. Um, we, as Sue mentioned, sculpture parks. Um, if you maintain a gallery, which it sounds like you do, but you have outdoor exhibitions, then you know, I would be looking to make a claim for those outdoor exhibitions. 
Um, the question here for about local authorities, which is a good one, um, we've come across quite a bit. Would we need to set up a trading arm um, to allow us to claim? Yes, you do. Um, well, you'll need a, a corporate subsidiary company. Um, I might just mention on that one, it, it's careful in terms of how you set it up. So I have had a subsidiary, a museum, um, sort of exhibition development company set up, but it was owned by a number of um, charities. So they were all sort of 25, 25, 25%. And because that subsidiary wasn't wholly owned by a charity, it couldn't make a claim. Mm. So I'd always recommend that you do get advice before mm. setting up um, a new company. So there's, is there a good example? Yeah, Manchester, um, Manchester Museum and Art Gallery have done that. There's a case study. So if you go to uh, the resources, we can send you that out afterwards. Do have a look at, at, at um, their case study. Brilliant. And um, so the impact of income hasn't been talked about in any detail, but can be significant. Um, E.g. if there are any changes to the exhibition by a gallery with free entry or a grant. In order to avoid any reduction to the amount to claim, you need to identify sufficient indirect costs that can't be claimed to offset the income. Yeah, I think that's, that's <laughs> a good point. Um, yeah. But in terms of those indirect costs, we can certainly start thinking about all our running costs, which in themselves could be quite considerable. So actually, I think what we're getting to here is that additional deduction that you can surrender for a tax credit is of less benefit if you're um, in a profitable position on your gallery. I'm, I'm yet to come across a gallery that's making a profit <laughs> on an exhibition, but... Uh, well done if you are. Um, but yes, it's, think more widely about what indirect costs you can bring in. Um, Brilliant. And just to say that Kate's just put the case studies into the chat there. Um, right, so are there in industry benchmark statistics available for the levels of claims made? From Isabel's information, Chisholm Hale have claimed museums got an exhibition tax relief of approximately four to 5% of annual income. Um, I suppose on the ones I've been working with, it's it's been around that point. So sometimes 10%. Um, but yes, it is a sizable proportion and it's unrestricted as we've as we've mentioned. Yeah. Um, so how many years can we claim back if we did not claim in the past? I always like this question. It's a good answer. <laughs> Yeah, so this is all dictated by the, the self-assessment regime, so it will depend when your year enders, but you've got two years to submit an amended return after your year end, so that could be three years back for your costs, depending on where your year end falls, mm -hmm. um, so, so it, I, it will depend. I mean, imagine if an organisation hasn't claimed and they're now just thinking about that return um, could be quite exciting for an organization at this point. So yeah, I do like that yeah. question. I share the same inquiry over how can there be a claim when income for grants has to be considered against the expect, expect, ugh, expenditure. So I think probably what we're getting at here is that we don't need to net our income off against our expenditure before we make a claim. We bring income in in grants, we bring expenditure in and we have a PL for that exhibition. And then we identify core costs within our expenditure and make a claim based on that. Um, so we still include all that expenditure, even if perhaps we've received a grant against it um, when we're working out what our, our tax credit can be. Great. Um, Yes, we will share, I think, a copy of the recording. Um, um, I think that's, that's the, pl with the plan to do that. Um, can you share guidance on how you're able to claim VAT on exhibition expenditure? I have to admit, I'm not a VAT specialist, so yeah. I probably can't. 
are you you know register for VAT if it's within if it's a good idea to do so I mean I definitely get advice from your accountant from that because they need to look at all your finances to establish whether you should be registered for VAT because yes you can reclaim but you may get stung on the other end and have to charge it out if you do any sales so yeah get advice on that one final question um there's a gallery that don't have a permanent collection um two sites changing exhibitions at both missions seven days um and get um sorry Admission is a seven day, seven day admissions um, on both sites. Would you allocate general admission to the show of that site or consider it as a general admission and so to not include in the claim? That's a good question. It probably needs a bit more discussion, but I think if I'm, if you have a venue, you could well have a number of exhibitions in it. So if I go to I probably can't think of one I have to pay for because I'm based up in Scotland, which is <laughs> okay for me. But if I get charged £10 to go into the British Museum, the British Museum itself will have a huge number of exhibitions in it. So I wouldn't look to bring any of that £10 into any of my claims. Um, so it probably depends on your circumstances, Trevor. Brilliant. I think that's it. There's an amazing amount of questions and great questions from the participants. I've just sort of checked against the chat as well. Um, I can't sort of see directly, but there's lots of thanks to say, um, thank you for a, a, a good event. Um, so I think um, we'll call that to an end really. Um, we're coming up to half past. And just again, thank you ever so much to our panel today. And to all the work that Sue you're doing is absolutely incredible. It really is. I keep thinking of all the brilliant things that when we get to meet each other in person again, um, we can sit and have a have a drink and celebrate this work that you're doing because it is really, really, really fantastic for the sector. And come, you know, next April, and we're so determined, it's on my plan by the end of the year that we will have this sunset clause issue. Um, you know, really, really kind of worked out for the sector. Um, if not, then I'll be eating my hat and um, I'm embarrassed that we have ch actually haven't achieved that. But it is really on my plan. Each week we keep chipping away at the agenda and we're getting closer and closer to that answer. So, um, yeah, bear with us, everyone. And, um, and yeah, thank you for attending.